this is a sequel of our last um, discussion, little conference. Um, and today I want to talk about the present world situation and then later about threefold as a new impulse, which is unfortunately not very widely known. But today I would like to start with reading you the brand new editorial of our journal, but I had written it in German, so I translated it quickly in to English. And it is titled Russia and Germany and the Friedman Doctrine. You will, you will hear what that is. When I was last year in Dresden for a seminar, I learned that from 1985 onwards, Vladimir Putin, at that time, um, an agent of the KGB, I don't know what the English word is. KGB. Okay. Um, was residing in Dresden, which is called the Elbe Florence. Yeah. And not only that, he was residing there and his office where he worked from 1985 onwards was just about 150 meters away from his um, private, ho private home and in that office later the German Anthroposophical Society found its headquarters, the same building. I was quite struck because Putin, whatever you think about him, he speaks German and I think he knows more about German culture than most uh, present German politicians, has a certain appreciation. Now I hope that this mentioning Putin now does not fuel the hate emotions that spread over, uh, around the globe today, which is absurd, but it's a fact. And this hate that he now draws on himself, this Putin, can be likened with something which uh, happened about 100 years, 110 years ago, when the British elite had a kind of cold hate against Germany. And this British elite was responsible for the First World War origin. Those of you who don't know this, I strongly recommend to have a look at a very important book by two Scottish researchers. It's called Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War. Gary Doherty and Jim McGregor. And I dare to say this is the most important book on the First World War that has been written in the 20th century. It exposes the intrigues, the tricks, the deception of the British elite. And um, it was in Germany, these authors would have been hanged in the media. In, Britain, in, in Scotland, after it was published about five years ago, they were not hanged, but they were silenced. There was no, no echo in the press, which is maybe worse than being hanged publicly. Now, there is another parallel between the time of the First World War and the present time with the war in Russia, which of course everybody does not like a war. But sometimes it seems to be necessary. Now the parallel I wanted to um, 
talk about briefly is, in 1914, we had a situation in Germany where Germany was like sandwiched between West and East. And there were mobilizations of the French and of the Russian army without any real necessity. The German government and its chief general, um, Helmut von Moltke, did all they could till the last moment to ask Russia and France, would you undo these mobilizations? They are something vitally um, threatening us. And only after this was not successful, this attempt, Germany went to war. Not to make new, uh, not to conquer anything, but to have a kind of a security of its own existence national existence, nothing else. Is this fact in any way debatable? Or would you say it's historically factual? Oh yes, factual? oh yes. It's a historical fact. These two uh, people are the first ones who bring all the evidence from archives all over the world to show how Britain um, brought France and Russia on against Germany. And of course, the appearance is that it was of course the Germans who did it and who wanted war. Wrong. That's why I think this is a real key book. Um, I recently met one of the authors, Jim McGregor. Very interesting. He might be case for an interview for Catherine, maybe, sometimes. He grew up in a home of people who were having damaged by the war, his own father. And he grew up, thank you, he grew up like um, seeing people without arms, without legs, and in his childhood and youth, he asked himself, what was this war about? And when I'm grown up, I will clarify this question. That was his motive of his life. And he did. So the British elite struggled to have a situation where Germany was getting into a war in order to get rid of the comp competition of the German very strong at that time economic power and other reasons. And in Russia, you had since at least 10 years, especially since um, 2014, with the Kiev throwover of the government by American, uh, you know, um, Mrs. Newland, who spent, who was proud to spend, I don't know how many thousand dollars. It was a fake transition into a new government. And since 1899, the NATO step by step expanded the um, expansion into the East. In total, in total, um, opposition to what they promised the German government and the NATO, no inch towards the east. That was a promise to Gorbachev. And immediately after that, they started to go into, of course, Eastern Germany was then becoming part of the NATO. In my view, totally superfluous because one could say when the Warsaw Pact states gave up their existence. Why didn't the, the NATO do the same? So they expanded, expanded, expanded. And of course, Russia saw all these states around, Romania, Hungary, Hungary etc., became 
uh, NATO states. And there was one red line, not the Ukraine. We don't accept that. And it was very near. There were some hints that the Ukraine was just before um, making an entry into NATO. And that was the point. In order to prevent that, Putin started what they call aggression and whatever, just to make clear, no NATO in the Ukraine. That's the historical parallel between the situation of Germany in 1914 and Russia in 2022. And in the West, nobody, almost in the press, takes note of the prehistory of the NATO aggressions around Russia. They just don't reflect on that. And it looks like there was no history of that. They just banked like um, without any reason, which is wrong. And instead of taking note of the whole terrible aggressiveness of the NATO history of this uh, terrible war, in the West, they ignore this completely and substitute this by stupid solidarity explanations, you know, really stupid, and useless sanctions which of course will fall back to those who do these sanctions. And those people don't reckon with the fact that also the Russians have a certain ability to also make sanctions on another level. And the West will feel that. Maybe soon with the energy crisis coming, etc., etc. And now, what is one of the worst things? When Germany decided recently to deliver weapons into the Ukraine. Um, that is only helping to fulfill the worst fears of certain people in the Western elite. What were these fears? They were outspoken, uttered by a man who is a real representative of the US foreign policy. The man is called George Friedman, and he publicly said, and we give the source here, if you want, I can give it to you afterwards. Um, the primary interest throughout the last century um, for the US foreign policy were the relations between Germany and Russia. For if they would have united, they would be the only power that could threaten us. And we had to make sure that this never happens. George Friedman, five years ago. And now one of the most um, effective instruments to make sure that this never happens is precisely the NATO. And the task of the NATO was once um, described by its very first general secretary called Lord Ismay, who was installed, if you like, by Winston Churchill who was never a friend of Middle Europe, especially of Germany, on the contrary. And what did he say when asked, why did we have, do we have the NATO now, the NATO? To keep the Soviet Union out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. You find this wonderful statement on the very website of the official of the NATO. I looked it up this morning. There it is. They don't even hide it. Historically, you can understand to a certain degree, but for the present situation, to put Germans down and Russians 
Soviet Union former out is horrible. But they are shameless enough to have that still on their webpage. Now, a big thought now is, and this comes from another quarter, not from a Western elite, but from Middle Europe, from a man like uh, Rudolf Steiner, who said to hold that in the long run, the Middle European and the Rus Russian Slavic development must go against totally such Friedman and Ismay doctrines, even if the Western elite don't like that. And maybe that's the end of the present editorial. It's maybe a bit pessimistic. This will only be possible after the next European catastrophe, which seems to be ushered in with all means right now. Now, this is the general frame for the talk for today, Russia and Germany. That's why I was very struck about this little coincidence of Putin living in, in Dresden. And um, there were missed chances, opportunities of making an approach between Russia and Germany. They were put steps, but now they give up, you know, the pipeline thing and rather freeze their asses to death, so to speak, than make um, um, a good politics policy. Now, we can go back. This all has 100 years or more historical background. One was, again, the plans in the Western elite. These plans included uh, to make in Russia so-called socialist experiments. There is a clear source, I could give that to you, we have the publication in London, in which some people said we, there will be a next great European U, uh, war coming in 1914, it was prophesied about 20 years earlier, and then we will have experiments in socialism in Russia, which were not, a, not a possible to um, perform in the West, but Russia will be the country for socialist experiments. And there is an illustration, so to speak, of this in a map that was, that was um, published in a British satirical journal called The Truth in the Christmas number of 1890. You find this map called The Kaiser's Dream. This is the Kaiser, Wilhelm. What does he dream of? It's a nightmare dream. He sees all of Europe is full of republics. French Republic, Austrian Republic. In Germany, you have even republics, more than one, prefiguring what happened after the Second World War. And the territory of Russia is just inscribed with the words Russian desert which is a pictorial way of saying, there we have no known forms of government, neither monarchy nor democracy nor something, but this is the place for the Russian um, socialist experiment, which then realized under Bolshevism from 1917 onwards. So we have Bolsh the birth of Bolshevism prefigured in the West in this prophecy. And this came absolutely true. Then we can say in Middle Europe, there was something else in the same year. 
And I'm going to talk about that now in the second part. What did come out of Mitten, Middle Europe? So we have the socialist experiment in the West, uh, in the East, installed by Western elite people. And it lasted, as we all know, till 18, uh, 1989, when Putin, I think, left Dresden. And it was installed by the West and it was, what is the other word, taken away again by Western powers who were interested in having now a global market. So socialism is not necessary anymore, but we keep to say in our little group, the socialist experiment installed upon Western uh, initiatives in 1917 was not abolished in 1989. It was going to be globalized. And that's what we have today, in a way. The Bolshevist experiment has been globalized. China, but that's only one of it. We have it everywhere. This was the Eastern um, thing, which was Bolshevism in full bloom. And in Middle Europe, you had, you know, I have to first say in, um, Okay, an inadequate program, you know, of um, telling people every nation has to be self-determined sounds all very wonderful, but it's not practicable in the way he thought. So you have the Wilson Doctrine, later the 14 points, in which he said uh, nations must free people. The other way would be better. Free people must free nations. So you have the Wilson Doctrine, you have Leninism in the East, and in the Middle European uh, sphere, you had something really useful and new. But it was suppressed. And I will give you in the next part an, an accurate example of how this was performed. We have the suppression of what came in Middle Europe. What was that? It was the idea, and we were going to talk in another talk about it more in detail. You have the idea of threefold social organism as an alternative to the old state forms, be it monarchy, being democracy, being um, tyrannical, despotic, government like in Russia, uh, in which you have three autonomous fields of economy, of the right sphere, and of the spiritual matters, education, etc., etc. This must be divided in the future. This idea is basically not so difficult to understand but it corresponds to the need of human beings for more differentiation of the three basic powers of thinking, feeling, and willing. Thinking has to do with a free spiritual life, feeling with a, a quality a life of the right sphere, and willing is, can be applied in economic world. Of course, it is a bit more differentiated. We will talk about this later. Today, I only want to point to one point. This idea was brought to the notice of the last emperor of Europe, Austrian Emperor Charles. Now, Charles had a good friend from youth whom he later made his chief of the cabinet with a great uh, trust, etc., etc. Now, this chief of the cabinet had a brother who was 
happen to be many things, agriculture and this and that, and he happened also to become a pupil of Steiner. And in 1917, when we have the socialist experiment started to unfold, Steiner reunited three persons in Berlin to initiate them to the new alternative of threefold. And why? Because one of them asked, Dr. Steiner, how can we get out of this um, war, he was a German, uh, in a decent way? And then Steiner unfolded the program or the idea of threefold, made some memorandum in short points and gave it to a few people. And one of them was the brother of Ludwig Polzer, the anthroposophist. The brother was um, Arthur Polzer, the chief of the cabinet of the emperor of Austria. So Arthur Polzer had the intention to let the Kaiser know of this truly Middle European alternative to the old fashioned Western models of government and of course also to the socialist experiment in the East. Then he was immediately in the 1917 year involved into a lot of intrigues and the Kaiser had to separate himself from him. Later he said, Count Polzo was torn out of my hands, so to speak, by all sorts of dirty intrigues. So he loved him, but he was under pressure. And that meant that Polzo, his chief of the cabinet, could not quickly enough bring this idea to the Kaiser, but he had to wait till he was sacked. That was, I think, in November 1917. And then, after his demission, he handed over this memorandum. And lo and behold, Emperor Charles was quite interested in it. He said, this is noteworthy to study. This is a real alternative. And later, he lost this uh, memorandum and asked his chief of the cabinet, could you make me another pro memoria, which he did. And he discussed with him the idea of threefold. Now, this was very important because if the last emperor in Europe would publicly say, look, we have not only the program of Wilson, we have not only what the um, um, people in Russia do, the Leninists, etc. We have a really middle European program. People would have at least noted it as something worth. Um, there was a saying, I, I don't know who was this, the man who said that or the woman, if the emperor of Austria-Hungary um, mounts on his horse, all the people will follow him. He was a representative figure. So that he was meeting the idea of threefold, which was a truly European alternative to Wilsonianism and Leninism, is significant. Now, his chief of the cabinet, a couple of years after Kaiser Karl died in exile in Madeira, put there by the British. Madeira is quite far from Vienna. They wanted to make sure that there was not a second Napoleon who suddenly comes back, you know, so put him far away. There he died, consumption, in a very unhealthy situation. And then his chief of the cabinet, his former chief of the cabinet, wrote a biography. This was, of course, the authority book, authoritative book on this, um, on this emperor. Here is a 
in a very respected um, publishing company came out in 1990, um, 1929, and it was immediately practically translated into French, into Italian, and into English. And the English one was, of course, the most important one. I think it was one and a half years later, you got an English copy. Now, in this book, Polzer, as he was a bit inspired by his brother, who was an anthroposophist, he was not himself. Um, I think his brother showed him the plants in the West that were crystallized in this map that you have photographed, the Kaiser stream. And the very first footnote of this book is, of course, there were, were also intentions to ruin the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And he says, this goes back to the people behind these plans that were crystallized in the Kaiser's dream. No monarchies anywhere. So, of course, no Austrian-Hungarian monarchy. And he said, but of course, it was also the Middle Europeans, the Middle European statesmen, who helped to uh, bring this program of no monarchies into reality. So he does not just blame the West, he said, it is the sleepiness of the Middle European statesmen, a sleepiness which is still there today, of course. Because if Germany now sends weapons to the Ukraine, this is the most idiotic thing that Germany can do with Russia. And this first footnote shows that he had a certain idea of the larger uh, contexts. The writer of the biography of Kaiser Karl. There is no other biography comparable till today. So one day I was told by a friend in England, look at the English translation of this book, The Emperor Karl, uh, which came out in 19, as I said, 30, and then there was a great a review in the New York Times, Emperor Karl the Kindly Habsburg, it was called. So it was clear that this book, especially the English version, would be read with great interest by many people in the world. Nostalgic reasons, last emperor, let's look at his life. And then if you go and look into this book, you make a very strange discovery. Footnote one, which was a key footnote for the larger aims behind what led to the First World War by the English elite, is simply missing. It's not there. So you go and look for it, it's not there. Then you read this book, if you read German, and find, well, there were talks between um, the chief of the cabinet about the threefold, and he introduces it in his text, writes about it. No trace. It's not there, nothing. In this book, of course, in this index, you go and look and say, well, we know from the German version, he had connections with, indirectly at least, with Steiner. Where is Steiner? Nowhere. Where is his brother who brought him the memorandum? Nowhere. And the peak of the whole scandal is, you look at the appendix, there are about 10 items in the appendix. In the German version, there was the whole memorandum on threefold for Austria. Printed. First printing, 
No anthroposophist had published that before. Steiner hadn't published it. It was a private thing for a few people. It was printed here, and you turn to the British, uh, English, American version. It's simply missing the whole text. And in the book, he said, the chief of the cabinet, well, even if the idea would have met difficulties in putting into practice, if Kaiser Karl stood behind it, which he did orally, it might have been something that people could not bypass. The world would have to take notice of it, and it would, this would be a healthy thing. In order to prevent that, it was just cut away. That was a discovery that was really shocking me as a biographer of these people. And I could see something which was also met by these authors of hidden history. They bring the story that in 1930, Hoover, uh, President Hoover, sent some food ships into Europe for war-stricken uh, children, etc. And on the way back, the ship was loaded with a lot of archive material throughout Europe. All these archive things were brought to some hidden bunkers, treasures in California, so that nobody would ever look at these documents. And I thought, oh, that is a principle. And this is just one example I found. And, you know, I heard an interesting, controversial, but interesting Italian critic of the present situation saying he is a Franciscan, calls himself Fra Pugnolo in Rome, edits all sorts of things about the COVID uh, farce, about whatever, says, for example, also, uh, Bill Gates is connected to Skull and Bones, you know, the, the Yale Club, uh, which has a great, had a great influence. And then he says, well, those in power, those globalists who want to have everything controlled through chips, through injections, etc., etc., um, they have been able to see that the people, the opponents, the opponent movements, they lack a uniting general idea for how it could go on. They have no vision. They have one. The globalists have one. But those who oppose it lack the vision. And immediately it came to my mind again the fact about threefold, who is not there and who was really like in an info war, prevented to become even publicly discussed, even if not every, everyone liked it. And that's the way these uh, elites go about to control our consciousness. So this is not, you could say, this is just an unimportant little thing, but I think it's huge. Because if threefold would have been known not only by anthroposophists, and the first man who published this was not an anthroposophist, but he thought, this makes sense, more sense than anything else, more sense than Wilsonianism, more sense than Leninism. That would have made a difference. And so it's high time today to bring this out into the world, which will be probably one of our next talks about. So this is, a, I call this a symptomatic example of infowar throughout the history of the, second, uh, the 20th century. And you know, note this book is important also for the fact that Kaiser Char Charles, as a, a brave, um, a solid, a solid, I should say, Catholic, was in 2005, I believe, um, 
beatified by the Catholic Church. And in the process of a beatification, I don't know whether the sanctification is still to come or not, um, they have to go through the documents and the life, and this is the source. So also in the Catholic Church, threefold, of course, is long known, but these peoples are not friends of bringing this idea into a fertile circulation, which today I think is still necessary because this is the alternative, the unknown alternative to all these public disasters that we are in. And now, if, yeah, you, if please. you were to recap, if you were to recap for the viewers who don't know what the threefold means, Threefold means that structuring the social realities. There are three elements that in the traditional state are... Yeah, but Besser is the only Okay. Element. Yes, the weather is beautiful here. <laughs> yes. huh? The setting is also beautiful. I'm very happy that this tree blossomed just in the right time, namely before your arrival. Yeah, what, yesterday. What kind of tree is this? Magnolia. Mm -hmm. I think it's somewhere from the east originally. That's why it is blossoming quickly, intensively, and then it goes over. Unfortunately, I always find it very sad when it is over. That's why we film it. Exactly. We make it a bit eternal. Yes. No threefold you can go back to the three ideals of the French Revolution. Why don't we just ignore it? We ignore it. Ignore it. There is always barking when great things happen. <laughs> Equality and brotherlyhood. They refer to three spheres in our lives. Spiritual sphere, freedom, freedom of opinion, every artist needs that, every scientist. Equality where everyone is equal with everyone else, no matter whether he is socially on the ladder higher or not. And brotherlyhood would be the ideal for a real uh, world or con economic order, which is for all people beyond national interests. So these three ideas refer to three spheres which are so far in the history were too much interlinked because the king was responsible for all matters in his kingdom, spiritual right matters. Um, take a man like Philippe Le Bel of France who suppressed the Templars Everything was in his hand. And that is inviting the abuse of power if it is concentrated in one hand. So in the French Revolution, there were these ideals which would need it, which have needed three more or less autonomous spheres, spiritual life, education, etc., a life of justice, law, which would actually be only responsible for the security of the citizens. The state is too much all-powerful, so it, it should deflate a bit. And then brotherlyhood as the great ideal, which has not been, of course, today, absolutely not met by the globalists, which only act for the little elite, which is a percentage of the population on the planet, which gets richer and richer and the rest gets poorer and poorer and, and may go to hell for their um, visions. So that is threefold, means three ideas, three faculties, the ideas I named, freedom, equality, brotherlyhood. The three faculties are willing from the bottom, feeling and thinking, and they are in every man. And modern man, and that was the, 
that was the special thing that Steiner saw as a natural urge that these three ideals and faculties get more autonomous than in the Middle Ages. Human consciousness develops. For example, in the Middle Ages, you had a soul constitution in which when you uttered an idea, people were reacting with their feeling and with their willing to it. For example, when Bernhard von Clairvaux blew the trumpet for a crusade, he gave a big sermon and at the end, people were packing their, you know, their, their cases and followed him for the Holy Land. But that's over. That was a time where feeling and thinking and willing were still knit together. And in that time, a state in which a monarch rules over all these three spheres, that was okay. But as human soul developed, it is not okay anymore. And that's why we need this change in a differentiation of the threefold social organism. We're going into that a bit more in another talk. That is just the basic. And that's why this memorandum that was published by a non-anthroposophist that was passed on to the last emperor and was met with interest by him is such an important thing that it is really a horrible fact to see how this was eliminated, tried to el eliminate from the uh, consciousness of readers of this biography of the last emperor. If they would have known, oh, he was interested in threefold social organism. What is that? Let's have a look at it. He was not stupid but it was just suppressed. Anyway, for the, for the end, I would like to give you another insight that comes from the same Steiner, who was politically absolutely awake, who knew about all these secret societies, uh, not only blah, blah, or conspiracy theory, because they're real, really active. These two authors make that very clear, and they are not anthroposophists. They have not a real concrete spiritual insight, but they see the workings of these secret elite, which go back um, the origin of clarifying these things are not with these two authors, but with a man like um, Carol Quigley, who wrote about the uh, American or English-American establishment, who wrote a big monumental book called uh, Tragedy and Hope. We brought some passages in our Percy's publishing company. Or a man like Sutton, Anthony Sutton, who found after studying National Socialism and studying Bolshevism, he found the same actors behind both movements. And they were all united in the Yale Club skull and bone. So this is behind that. And Steiner is absolutely on the same line. He only goes maybe in some points a little bit further. And to close this talk, which is at present uh, directed to help us to see a bit large perspectives on the present mess, we could say, social, economic, spiritual, the whole prison situation most people feel in, I want to give you a short text, which was first published by our little journal, the Europea, 22 years ago. And I got it from an anthroposophical archive by a man who was helping us in our work all the time. It was never published before. It was a note by Steiner. 
I'll read you just for a few sentences. There exists a group of people who set the tone for the development of mankind today. They wish to rule the earth by utilizing the mobility of the capitalist economic impulses. All circles of men belong to this power structure which this group is able to bind and harness to its ends. By the way, this text can be found on our webpage in English. You can download it. Um, the essential factor is that this group knows that there lies a population in the region of the Russian territory that is not yet formed or organized as regards to the future. Those people who started the socialist experiment knew this. They knew you can do this experiment with a young Slavic population. You could not do this in France or in England. The well-defined goal is to bring this budding socialist impulse under the control of the anti-social group. Now, this goal cannot be reached if Middle Europe summons up appreciation and sympathy for the budding Eastern impulse and seeks to unite with it. That's a key. And I'm, I go to the end. The Europeans, um, these people, by the way, are called Pluto autocrats, Pluto autocrats. And Middle Europe has to reveal their, their disguised way of working uh, in our order to get control over the budding Eastern Russian impulse. That means behind these intentions are people who have a large understanding of the development of whole peoples, young, mature, old age. The French are past their climax, the British are presently the most important for these people. And the Russians, the Slavic, rather, it's not the same, they are bearers of the future. And if you want to be powerful in the future, we must make ourselves the educators of the young Slavic peoples. And that's what is behind the experiment in socialism uh, brought by Lenin into the East. So um, admirable large forms of thoughts which you usually totally miss in any European parliament and with most European statements, they don't have this. And in the end, the text says, um, there are only two possibilities. Either one must unmask the lie with which the West is obliged to operate, if it is, has to have success, one must say, the leaders of the Anglo-American cause promote a movement originated nating from impulses which arose before the French Revolution, that means in a time where there were still monarchies, and which intends to achieve the control of the world through the means of power provided by capitalism. To achieve this control, these leaders make use, careful, of the impulses of the revolution, but only as empty phrases behind which they conceal their real motives. The empty phrases you hear every day. We fight for democracy. Yes, we Ukrainians and uh, people adore this phraseology. They use this because they know that's what people actually wish for. So let's give them the empty phrases that they believe we satisfy this deep urge for freedom, democracy and liberty. But it's all only 
phraseology. Every second word of Biden or other people is just on this level. Either the Europeans have the courage, that's my word, to reveal, unmask the lie, or they don't. And if they don't, the alternative is, if one doesn't do this, one surrenders world control to a knuckled group within the Anglo-American world. Until sometime in the future, emanating from the subjugated German Slavic territory through rivers of blood, the true spiritual goal of the earth will be saved. That's a very grave alternative. And I feel this notebook text by Steiner is absolutely actual in the present time, especially as what I read in the beginning, some American think tank leader thinks the most important goal of the American foreign policy was to prevent a uniting of the Russian and the German Middle European impulses. The opposite is true. But that's the, how the elite tries to work with power, with the power of the media, which is a sort of black magic media spreading all the lies perpetually. I hope you see the whole picture, how this connects. And I'm not, of course, to come back to the beginning, far from idealizing a man like Putin. But I think if you see the larger context, you will understand that something had to be done as a resistance to this overriding the whole Eastern sphere by Western economic materialistic impulses. And people could ask themselves, why do we have the NATO? Is the NATO necessary? It's not. It's just an inst instrument of expansion of power. And we need a deeper understanding of all these things and get away from the personal emotions and demonizing people and be stupid with people who just blah, make blah, blah and have nothing else in their mouth than empty phrases. So I hope you won't have um, um, problems with this lecture, Catherine. Look, they are idolizing Putin again. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> again. Yeah. Yes, again. No, it's a larger context we have to try to think in. And look at these people with this map. They are far-seeing. They have great plans. They have uniting ideas. But the uniting ideas are not such that they, that they serve humanity. They serve a little elite of globalists. And that's the real drama we have today. That's why people have to wake up to real alternative ideas as they will find them when they turn to threefold possibilities of uh, making things peacefully evolve. So that was, let's call it our Magnolia speech. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Robert. Thank you. Very good.